Come with me to Leavenworth, charming little village nestled in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. It's a place so special that thousands of visitors year-round find their way here. They come for a taste of Bavaria. Leavenworth is alive with the sound of music, but just a few years ago, the village was dying. Today we'll probe its fascinating story. It is written. This is George Vandeman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today, the miracle of Leavenworth. The story of Leavenworth takes us back to the 1800s when gold was discovered in British Columbia. Hundreds of miners flocked through the Cascades on their way north to instant wealth, panning the streams of north-central Washington as they went. Some chose to settle near what is now Leavenworth. In 1884, homesteaders arrived as the first families in the area, naming their town after the land developer, Captain Charles Leavenworth. Their first buildings were crude, rough-sawn structures, Settlers built homes, a church, and a number of saloons. In 1897, however, the Great Northern Railway began work on a tunnel through the summit of the towering Cascades. Then after the turn of the century, an Eastern Lumber Company built one of the largest sawmills in the state, along with a bank, a company store, and a hotel. Unfortunately, like so many towns of that time, Leavenworth suffered frequent fires. Four terrible fires burned down almost half the business district. But the townspeople were not discouraged. They replaced wooden buildings with those of brick and block. Leavenworth survived and thrived, of course fueled by the twin payrolls of the railroad and the sawmill. By 1920, Leavenworth had outgrown its rough and ready early days. Prohibition closed the saloons and the town became a center of a large farm and mining trade. Electricity, of course, and modern telephone brought comfort and convenience. A promising future smiled on the village. Then, during the 20s, a twofold disaster struck this little town of Leavenworth. The Great Northern Railway decided to pull out. With it went its huge payroll. Then the sawmill closed down. Before the town could recover from these twin misfortunes, the Great Depression of the 30s brought economic paralysis. World War II came and went without the once thriving commercial center recovering its prosperity. By the 1960s, Leavenworth lay in an economic coma. Vacant buildings haunted the village. Stores went out of business, boarding up their windows, of course. Little Leavenworth appeared doomed to oblivion. Yet despite the odds against them, the good citizens refused to surrender their beloved town. But what on earth could they do? Well, in 1963, with help from the University of Washington, they organized themselves into a community project named LIFE, meaning Leavenworth, Improvement for Everyone. 200 of the town's 1,400 residents became involved, working in 16 committees. Each committee worked on some aspect of community development. The ladies of the town, with their green thumbs, developed the downtown city park. And they won a national first prize in the Sears Roebuck competition for garden clubs. June of 1964 brought the next step in the rebirth of Leavenworth. Ted Price, chairman of the Life Tourism Committee strongly urged the townspeople to stage an autumn leaf festival. After a stormy discussion, the committee approved the idea. Today, this festival remains Leavenworth's most popular annual event. At the same time, Ted Price proposed remodeling the town as an alpine Bavarian village. Well, back in 1960, Ted and his partner 
Bob Rogers had converted their nearby cafe, the Squirrel Tree, into an alpine Bavarian-style restaurant and had built an adjoining motel. But not everyone agreed that the Bavarian theme was best. Some members of the committee favored an Old West setting. Others preferred the gay 90s theme. Discussion waxed long about which of these three proposals would become the inspiration for renewing Leavenworth. Well, finally, the majority agreed upon a Swiss Bavarian theme for the town. Now, the spring of 1965 brought a new group into existence, the Project Alpine Committee. By the following July, six pioneers of the new Leavenworth had committed themselves to launch out and convert their own buildings to the Bavarian model. Vern and Ann Herrett, Laverne Peterson, Ted Price, Bob Rogers and Owen, and Pauline Watson. The total dedication of those first six who risked everything inspired the good citizens of Leavenworth to catch fire with the idea of transforming their town. Well, at first, some found themselves reluctant to borrow the enormous funds necessary to achieve total old-world Bavarian authenticity. But finally, everyone agreed that no expense must be spared to reproduce a true Bavarian village. Balconies, flower boxes, old world, light fixtures, and the like. Local contractors learned special techniques of woodworking and stucco from craftsmen. But by 1967, the town had incredibly transformed, winning the admiration of the country. Look Magazine chose Leavenworth for its All-America City Award. Remarkably, all this was done through local resources, however. No government grants, no public handouts, no drain on taxpayers. Citizens just scraped up their savings, borrowed from commercial lenders and risked their solvency to finance their dream. No question about it, Little Leavenworth is the biggest self-help town in America. By the way, let me remind you that we have an unusual gift offer today at the close of our telecast. It'll be a real strength and blessing to you because it'll be a slide rule from which you can find many scriptures almost instantly. But now back to our story. Back to our story. The rebirth of Leavenworth offers more than a fascinating story for our telecast today. It has deep significance, spiritual significance for us personally. You see, we may find ourselves in a situation similar to Leavenworth after its early prosperity failed. Things in life we once counted on disappear. Finances forsake us or our health fades away. Maybe a loved one's death or divorce robs us of our dearest and best. We find ourselves facing a dim, dismal future. At last, the realization dawns that nothing in this world offers any real security, here and now, or any hope for eternity. And finally, like the citizens of Leavenworth, we decide we must confront reality and search for new life, you see? Well, long ago in old Jerusalem, a man named Nicodemus decided to take personal inventory. Outwardly, he enjoyed success of every kind, even belonging to the Sanhedrin, the national ruling council. Although wealthy, Nicodemus remained kindly and devout, respected, he was admired by all. He attempted to live by God's laws, seeking as they did in those days, to earn for himself a place in God's kingdom. Despite all this, Nicodemus had become strangely uneasy about his spiritual condition. What stirred these unsettling thoughts in his conscience? Well, a young carpenter from the hill country of Galilee had arrived in Jerusalem. Rumor had it that he could work miracles, even turning water into wine. But Nicodemus' fellow religious leaders quickly dismissed Jesus and his band of fishermen companions as uneducated fanatics. Their ridicule and rejection turned to fury after an incident in the temple. Jesus, claiming to speak for his Father in heaven, took upon himself the task of chasing out the greedy money changers and cattle breeders. But Nicodemus didn't join his peers in dismissing the ministry of Jesus. He'd long been concerned about the goings-on in the temple. It needed to be cleansed. The divine authority displayed by Christ impressed Nicodemus. 
Could this carpenter be some kind of prophet? He determined to find out, not daring to be seen with Jesus. He decides on a secret nighttime visit. He finds Christ in the moonlit olive grove just outside of Jerusalem. You see, the Savior, with no home of his own, often spent the night outdoors. Well, as Nicodemus enters the presence of the young carpenter, the distinguished leader feels a strange timidity, which he tries to hide, of course, under sort of a veneer of professionalism. We pick up the story in John, the third chapter, and the second verse. John, the third chapter, and the second verse. Here it is. Rabbi, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus hopes to inspire Christ's confidence by complimenting him. He wants to pave a way for a stimulating discussion, but actually his opening statement reveals hesitation and doubt. Nicodemus contradicts himself. He mentions Christ's signs or miracles, yet recognizes him only as a teacher. How could a teacher work miracles from God? Jesus must be much more, at least a prophet, perhaps even the Messiah. But Nicodemus hedges on his convictions as he approaches Jesus. Well, Christ understands all this. Reading Nicodemus as if he were an open book, he sweeps aside all these empty formalities and pierces straight to the heart of the matter. Notice verse 3, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, such frank words startle Nicodemus and offend his dignity. He came hoping to to discuss religion, but Jesus points toward his own spiritual deficiency. Shocking words. Here he was, a kindly and religious man respected by everyone, and this young upstart tells him he isn't fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus even says he must be reborn as a spiritual baby. So, with more than a trace of sarcasm, Nicodemus questions the possibility of an adult being born a second time. But deep down, Nicodemus understands something of what Christ is saying. You see, in the Jewish religion, converts were said to have been born anew into spiritual things. However, Christ's inference that he needs such an experience deeply offends him. Jesus refused to be deferred by Nicodemus' skepticism. Christ presses his point further, explaining that spiritual rebirth comes through receiving new life from the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus still can't accept what Christ is saying. How can these things be? He protests. Well, Jesus reminds Nicodemus about the experience the ancient Israelis had in the wilderness. After God led them out of slavery in Egypt, they forgot their mighty deliverance and rebelled. But when attacked by an onslaught of poisonous snakes, they quickly called on the Lord as death spread through the camp. And God heard their cry for salvation, providing a most interesting remedy for the snake-bitten sinners. He told Moses to erect a brass serpent on a pole, raise it high above the camp, Well, dying ones who looked upon that serpent were saved. That look, you see, required recognition of their problem. Looking at the serpent on the pole also involved placing faith in God's salvation rather than trusting to some human remedy. Jesus refers to this remarkable incident in telling Nicodemus. In verse 14 there, he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You may be wondering, how could Jesus, the Savior, link himself to a brass serpent? Well, the serpent is symbolic of sin's curse. How could such a repulsive thing, however, symbolize the Holy Son of God? Well, we find the answer in Galatians 3, verses 13 and 14, the New King James Version. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, see, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree, that he we might that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The curse of the law was death for the transgressor. Christ accepted that curse on the sinner's behalf. Your behalf, mine. 
but he hung on Calvary's tree. Jesus took our punishment, you see, our crown of thorns, so that we might be awarded his eternal crown of glory. He bore our death so that we might receive his gift of life by faith. Christ, explaining all this to Nicodemus, sums up the gospel in that favorite verse of ours, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a message. God, the king of the universe, loved this world, this stubborn world and rebellious sinners so much that he made the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf, the gift of his own life. As a result, all of us, all of us, no matter who we are or what we've done, all who choose to entrust themselves to him will escape eternal death and enjoy life forevermore with him. So belief in Jesus brings the new birth experience, you see. Salvation, new life, comes when we receive the Savior's sacrifice as our own. Well, Nicodemus walks home deep in thought from his midnight rendezvous with Jesus. For many months he ponders those piercing truths. Finally, on the same day that Christ's prediction of his death came true, that distinguished Jewish leader takes his stand at Calvary. And friend, each of us is involved, too, in what happened at the cross. Accepting Jesus is serious business. It's a matter of life and death. Notice John 3, 18. And he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. As we consider the new birth experience, we see some interesting parallels with the situation in Leavenworth. That village, you recall, was doomed. The people there had to face reality and take drastic action to escape their demise. Renovating their town required personal investment, even sacrifice. The Bavarian theme required adopting a new culture, some ways a new life. Even so, in a much deeper way, the new spiritual birth requires drastic action. Life in Christ involves deep personal commitment, decided change in lifestyle. To bring in new life, the people of Leavenworth had to dispense with some of the old. Some 400 junk cars, for example, had to be towed away. We too must be willing to part with rubbish, the rubbish of our past, in order to experience spiritual renewal. Sinful, selfish habits must be repented of so that new life, God's Spirit, can be ours. After we're born again, our battle isn't over. And Leavenworth, the renewing process once begun, needed to be carried onward. For example, in the late 60s, they began a program entitled Art in the Park. That outdoor art show now runs all summer long. 1975, they completed the beautiful waterfront park Beside the Wenatchee River, new buildings go up every year. The dream of Leavenworth continually expands and grows. Plans for the future include constructing a huge riverside castle. Imagine. Now, there are some important differences between the renewal of Leavenworth and our spiritual rebirth. Leavenworth was really a self-help movement. We can't save ourselves spiritually. We must declare religious bankruptcy and accept God's salvation as a free gift. Only by receiving that gift can our lives be renewed and restored. Of course, no matter how much our lives are changed, our characters remain incomplete, unfinished. So we must continually look away from ourselves, away from our own spiritual progress to the cross for our forgiveness. Christ's life and death for us was perfect and complete in his finished work at Calvary. We find our confidence of salvation. Well, our time together in this telecast is drawing to a close. You may recall a story in the news not so long ago that captivated our nation. The story of two teenagers in California's San Joaquin Valley. Felipe Garza loved Donna Ashlock, 
a perky, freckle-faced 14-year-old? Donna liked Felipe, too, although only as a friend. He was rather small for his 15 years. Although Donna thought he was cute and fun to be around, Felipe failed to spark her affections. She liked another classmate, you see. But Felipe just wouldn't give up on Donna. One evening, Donna collapsed in pain with a severely damaged heart. Doctors said she needed a transplant operation in order to survive. When Felipe heard about it, he said, I'm going to die. I'm going to give my heart to my girlfriend. Now, Felipe seemed to be in perfect health, but one morning, three weeks later, you remember, he awoke with a severe headache. His brain was hemorrhaging. The family rushed him to a hospital in Modesto where he died hours later. At last in death, Felipe's dream was fulfilled. Donna had his heart. The casket bore a bouquet, a single red rose, surrounded by baby breath with a ribbon reading, with love, Donna Eschlock. Can you imagine if dying Donna had refused Felipe's heart? What if she died in vain, refusing his gift of life? Well, thank God, she readily accepted the new heart. The last I heard, she was doing just fine. But how about you, my friend? God is offering you a new heart today. He so much loved you that he gave his only son for your salvation. Wouldn't it be a shame if you perished away from him? I urge you to accept God's new life just now as we listen to this. Jesus is the cornerstone Came for sinners to atone Though rejected by His own He became the cornerstone Jesus is the cornerstone When I am by sin oppressed on the stone I am at rest When the seeds of truth are sown He remains the cornerstone Jesus is the cornerstone Thank you. That was beautiful. Shall we pray? Father mine, thank you for loving us so much that you gave yourself so that we can be saved. Help us to so love you that we'll accept your gift of new life. Please put that leaven with experience in our hearts. Count as perfect in Christ as our characters become renewed into your image not through our works, but because of your mercy. Amen.
And now, let me share a very personal word. We often hear from friends and viewers who support our ministry with their gifts of love, checks for all amounts, large and small. I can't tell you how much they mean to us. But right now, with rising air time costs and a growing demand for our offers, our It Is Written books, we urgently need to request help from many new viewers. We'd love to have you on our team. In fact, we need you now more than ever before. Won't you take a moment just now to write out a check that will enable us to bless others as we've endeavored to be a blessing to you? Thanks so much for being a part of our family. And now, the offer for today. Today, we have a dynamic Bible study aid that will make your time spent with God's Word just that much more satisfying and rewarding. It's our It Is Written Bible Slide Rule, specifically designed to assist you in your treasure hunts through the pages of the Bible. This Bible Slide Rule is a handy study tool that will help you locate key Bible verses that reveal God's messages to you on any specific topic. It's yours free. Now here's the information you need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now. That's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, one 800 Two five three three thousand. Lines are open now. That's one eight hundred two five three three thousand. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California nine one three six zero. And now the time has come to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written: Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. people are haunted by some secret problem that they can never quite resolve or some secret sin that they can't overcome. In next week's program, you'll learn how God can help us handle our deadly secrets. That's next week at this same time on It Is Written. Invite a friend to watch too.